my speakers have collapsed a moment. I'm just waiting for them to come on. So, so I, I just want to add that there were over a hundred people <laughs> at the lecture, and uh, it's it's my fault that I didn't check. You know, it's it's different when you're face to face. Of course. Um, I should have mentioned that our vice chancellor, Professor Jane Harrington, is here. Yeah. So is Andrew Westby, Professor Peter Griffith. So. We've got a lot of people in the audience, and I'm sure people want to ask you questions. So Karen and I will be co-chairing okay. the Q&A session um, if there are any questions. Shall I stop sharing my screen? Hands up. Um, Laura, would you like to, to ask your questions? Yes, thank you. Um, good evening, David. Hello, Professor. <laughs> How what what a what a journey we've travelled since the PhD and before that. Without a doubt. Is, is what I'd say. Can I just ask you, um, yeah. because it, it's interesting, um, a lot of the stepping stones that you've used in the books and what. Yeah. What would be when you look back at the journey, the roller coaster that we travelled as we do in sexual health? Yeah. What surprised you the most? Oh, blimey, that's a tough one. Sorry, right, this is not your vibe. Yeah, okay. yeah. Well, well, I think, you've put me on the spot with this one, I think really what has surprised me the most is our university. Because when I showed you all the various things that's going on across the university, it is so proactive in talking about all of these different matters. In fact, one of the most recent initiatives was a new group that's been set up to talk about the impact of the menopause on members of staff. Um, yeah, members of staff in particular. And the first meeting that was held a few months ago, I thought, well, this is really important for me to go. And I thought, well, I wonder if I'll be welcome at that, you know, being the only bloke there sort of thing, <laughs> the, the only bloke in the village. So um, uh, I went along that meeting and I said, look, you know, if you don't want me here, that's fine, I understand. But some of them were saying, no, look, it's really important. Because when you consider that so many managers across higher education tend to be male, and when me the menopause in particular affecting so many people of a particular generation and those ge those people of those generations are imperative across the universities that the very fact that we're stopping to think about this and to do it all so positively i think is wonderful and it shouldn't surprise me but i think it's great fabulous Beautiful uh, lecture, and Th I hope to see you soon. Thank you, Laura. Can I just tell everybody, on the Royal College of Nursing's website, there are some professorial lectures on there, and I keep going back to Laura's over and over and over again, <laughs> because um, what I should have said right at the beginning is I never use notes to present, so this was a bit of a first for me tonight, just focusing on notes. But Laura, if you want to see a, no a good professorial inauguration, check out Laura on the RCN. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Laura. Mark. Hello, Mark. Hi, David. Wonderful lecture. Thank you. So lovely to be here. Thank you. Uh, that was a real trip down memory lane, I have to say. Uh, and we, we had a very similar trajectory, yeah. certainly in our early years. So I recognise that... Uh, that, uh, that self-doubt, I, I, I had it very much, so we were very similar in, in, in yeah. that move from practice to, to education. Mm. What a, what's a few decades it's been. Uh, so brilliant, really enjoyed your lecture, and so glad to be here. Oh, lovely, question thank you. Is this, yes. uh, do you think we should be better? You, you've talked about a lot of educational developments mm. and some of the things you've done around teaching and education. It's fantastic. Do you think we should be better at evaluating the impact of that on practice and patient care than we are? Um, yeah. Are, are, are we where we need to be on that? Or do we still yeah. need to, to do some movements um, uh, to be better at that? Yeah, without a doubt, Mark. And let me just go back to what you said right at the beginning about our trajectory together. I can remember a time when Mark and I used to teach the HIV course called the ENB 934. And once a year, all the 934 teachers around the country would get together so that's when mark and i first uh, first met 
Yeah, Mark, I do think there's a need for evaluation to go on here because whenever I'm teaching anything about sexual health or HIV, the stories that students tell me, especially about prejudice and discrimination that they've seen in practice, it's still going on. And in relation to HIV, for example, um, some of them will still tell me stories that a person's been admitted to a ward with HIV and the first thing that some of the practitioners want to do is to get them into a side room or reminding them to put double gloves on. This is something that was happening 40 years ago. And we're still hearing those stories today. And what I think is that the way stigma has impacted on this, in those early days of HIV in particular, the stigma was very much about fear, prejudice, discrimination, and the hostility that was going on. Now I think the way that stigma manifests itself is just in silence. No, nobody's talking about it. And let me just give you a very quick example here. I was doing an HIV session to a class of maybe 250, 300 students. And I could tell that most of them were 18 year olds straight from school. So I was asking them what they knew about HIV and they were all saying nothing. They hadn't covered it in sex and relationship education in school. Nobody knew anything at all really. So I started dropping in famous names. So, have you heard of Freddie Mercury? Do you know about Queen? All these different famous names to get them to think of it. And most of them hadn't heard many of them at all. Until in the end I said, what about Princess Diana? thinking she did such great work challenging stigma. They must have heard about her. And one of the young students in the front row said to the woman next to her, Princess Diana, she didn't die of AIDS, did she? And I thought, that is the level of knowledge. So whether we're looking at prejudice and discrimination still in the, in the healthcare practice, and where there's a difficulty then is when our students are witnessing this. So if they come back into university and tell us about it, how are we as teachers able to support them? But what can we do with their practice areas to bring them up to date? Thanks, David. I think you're spot on with that. Uh, I remember teaching a group a few months ago talking about, do you remember the adverts with the iceberg oh, yeah. and everything? And I suddenly realised... None of them were born when that no. happened. No, without that was about 1988. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you. Lovely. Man. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for being here. Thanks, Mark. Um, I don't see anyone, one else's hands up, but uh, oh, Sarah, Sarah Barber. Hello, Sarah. Hello, David. Hi there. Hello, David. I'm Bromley. I'm still here at the end of the clinic listening to your lecture. Bless you. Thank um, you. Which was lovely. And um, if I understood you rightly, <clears throat> I was really intrigued and interested to hear how creative you've been at Greenwich with <clears throat> weaving sexual health and sexual <clears throat> health matters throughout lots of different courses. Yeah. yeah. Now, I, I wanted to say that I thought that was such a... Um, a great way of, of saving sexual health courses mm -hmm. um, because of the issues with funding and because we can't get people onto courses as easily as we used to be mm. able to because of that issue, yeah. that it's a really creative way to sustain um, sexual health education provision, if I've understood that correctly. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, and it really is so necessary. I'm just echoing what um, the previous... Um, Mark. person was saying yeah. about attitudes and what you commented on is that it's all perhaps a little bit more subtle these days in terms of attitude and stigma. Yeah. So I was with a medical student yesterday and we were chatting about this and she said, um, she said, yeah, but I'm still nervous about taking blood tests. Um, and mm -hmm. we were discussing, and, and I remember, um, uh, you know, cognitive dissonance and all of the stuff about, you know, it, logically, you know, there's no risk, but yet people are still yeah. feeling this this fear. So mm. it's still really necessary yeah. um, to keep going with all your good work. So good luck. With Lovely. It. Thank um, you so much. It was great to listen to you. Thank you, Sarah. Can I just say on that point that you've just made there, sometimes the students will say to me that they've heard in practice that maybe they need to wear two sets of gloves or maybe they're nervous about taking the bloods. And I say, look, when you know the modes of transmission of HIV, you just need to consider these three things. Are you having condomless intercourse with your patients? Are you sharing needles with your patients? And are you 
practicing universal precautions. As long as you're fine on those, you've got no risk with HIV. You know, and it is making it as, as normal as that. And even when you mentioned about teaching it right across the undergrad programmes, with the mental health team a few years ago, a whole group of them got together and we were looking at every single mental health module that's run and what are the dimensions of sexual or gendered health that may be important. So I've now managed to customise teaching. It's different on every single module. Um, you know, so that's that's the important thing. But I think if we set up a, a, an interested group, rather than it being left to certain individuals to do it, then it means everyone will be empowered to do it. And we can share our resources together so somebody else may want to do it. And it could be someone that's feeling a bit nervous, maybe they've never done it before, and someone needs to hold their hand. But, yeah, wonderful opportunities indeed, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, we'll probably, I know that there's lots of other questions, so we'll probably start to wrap, wrap it up. But um, we've got Libby, then Nicole, then Matthew, um, then Jane, and then Kafui. So lots of questions. And then after that, I'll ask uh, Derek to do closing remarks. So Libby, would you like to go next? Thanks. Yeah. Hi, David. Thank Hi, you. Libby. No Thank you. I apologise. No camera. Um, but, David, really interesting, actually, what, you, what you've just said, <clears throat> what I wanted to pick up on, is that I've taught for many years the first-year pre-reg nursing <laughs> skills type course, mm -hmm. and one of the things we do in that is universal precautions. And this is at a very fundamental <clears throat> level. So we ask the little scenarios, what would you wear gloves and aprons for? And it's, you know, changing a catheter... Um, doing a dressing and one of them is taking the pulse of an HIV patient and it's still really kind of disappointing yeah. that quite a few of them think they should wear gloves for taking the pulse of an HIV place, uh, patient and we have to talk about well what are you coming into contact with but it just occurs Gosh, to me that yeah. although that's, that's obviously disappointing that yeah. that's still the position because yeah. when you ask them it does seem to be a bit of a a stigma type thing yeah. because they don't say the same if it's hepatitis B, yeah. they don't give the same answer. But what it occurs to me is that obviously the next time that happens, I shall use it as, an, uh, as a trigger to start talking about stigma and bias and those sorts of things. So thank Fantastic, you for lovely. Of that. Thank, thank you, you Libby. And the university has just spent millions of pounds on designing our new simulation suites. And we've even got this brand new MSc in interprofessional healthcare simulation. So looking at how we can implement some sexual and gender health in the teaching, learning and assessment uh, um, for those as well. So whether it's doing things like taking cervical smears, taking blood from people. So it might be that when you do an, um, um, an assessment or an OSCE of your students, give them... HIV as one of the issues to talk about or give them gender difference so it's normalizing all of the stuff I've been talking about normalizing it right across all of our teaching learning and assessment thanks Libby thanks Libby Nicole thank you um, David hi Nicole that was inspirational <laughs> thank you darling Nicole graduated with her ESC arms in sexual health with us a few years ago. She's now teaching at Christ Church, Canterbury, and she's doing her doctorate in education. Oh, thank you. All from the inspiration of David, I must say, he's been very pivotal to me in everything I've done, and I really, you know, want to pay honour to that. So thank you, David. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so just a really, really quick question, I guess. Um, as a fellow, fellow educator and a, and a previous student, as you've already said, I guess I wanted to pick your brains. Um, what has been your focus in terms of supporting student nurses to address sexual health in a system which has been under strain more recently? And how do you create those patterns of hope, I guess, mm. um, for sexual health in, in what you teach? Yeah. Yeah. I hope that makes sense. No, that's fine. That's great. Um, what I've done is actually put in more time for pastoral care. Say, for example, with all of our students who've been working in sexual health, and one in particular I can think of who graduated with us just a few weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> she'd been working in a sexual health service for the past 
decade or so. So at nine to five, regular time within a service. And when COVID-1 came in, she was deployed into a hospital, put, and she hadn't worked in a hospital for a decade, but moved into a hospital, but actually put onto an intensive care unit where she had to do four 13-hour shifts a week. Now, from going from sexual health clinic, nine to five, into that, so what I found with so many of our students, whenever they want some time with me uh, um, on camera, and I must admit, I've not been on campus at all since. So all of my work is, is here on camera. And uh, where, when I used to just give an hour for their tutorial sessions, for example, now I'm building in a bit of extra time with them because for so many, they need pastoral support and time just to dump to offload um, the, 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 the tragedy that they've been going through at the moment. So it's being with them and supporting them, and then we can start talking about their studies. Absolutely. Thank you, David. Lovely. Thank that. you, Thank Nicole. You. Thanks. Thanks, Nicole. Matthew. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, I, that was awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yeah, a little bit embarrassing having my picture uh, there as well. Um, I, I'm just quite interested in, in this area of intersection, intersectionality between the theories around that the, the, we sort of come around sort of, um, uh, heteronormative relationships mm -hmm. and the invisibility that you spoke about, mm -hmm. about particular sexualities. And one of the things that has struck me recently, especially in the gay community, is the sort of um, move to, to take away different sexualities. So BDSM, and you know, there's whole debates about whether people who are part of the BDSM community should actually be part of uh, gay pride, because mm -hmm. heterosexual and children would see people in gig masks and mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what your take is on that. I'm trying to look on my bookshelf and I just can't see it a minute. Oh, yes, I can. Right. Fabulous little book, The Trouble With Normal. And in there, especially when you're talking about heteronormativity, even the way in which same-sex couples can get married now. So my, my partner and I, we've been together for 30 years. We did the civil partnership because we thought, well, that's going to give us equality in law. And then all of a sudden, I found out a few years later that it's not quite as good as that because if one of us were to die then the other one only gets the pension back as far as the civil partnership law came in. But if you're married, they get the full lifetime pension. So there was some inequality. So I was very resistant to the idea of marriage, especially reading books like this, The Trouble with Normal, which is looking at queer theory, and thinking, why do we want to opt into that world? So when you're talking about the heteronormative world, yes, in many ways, and certainly queer theorists talk about this, by lesbian and gay people opting in for same-sex marriage, there has had to be a certain acceptance of that particular form of lifestyle. But at what cost? What have we given up? And when you're talking about people in the BDSM community, for example, just about maybe three or four years ago, one of our mental health undergraduate students... Um, she asked if I could be her supervisor for her dissertation and she wrote her dissertation and when it was seen by the other marker I'll never forget the other marker's face he came running out of his office and he'd marked he said David have you just read this it was fantastic she was looking at the role of stigma against people who are into bondage domination sadomasochism within mental health services and what her dissertation looked at was the role of stigma in itself Self, how it was felt by practitioners, uh, by, uh, 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 by the patients who were practitioners of BDSM, and how it was enacted. So it really tapped into Goffman and stigma theory. So, you know, here's the theory, there's the enactment, and there's how it's felt. So, yeah, we've got to keep challenging that. And I think, but it's queer theory that's going to help us keep on picking away at it. Uh, and Matthew, Matthew is our new visiting professor in integrated sexual health and HIV. So welcome, Matthew. Great. Thanks, Matthew. Thank you. Jane. Hi, Hello, Jane. Hi, Hello. I just wanted to say, as you know, I've been wanting to come to your lectures for about a year. <laughs> and I can tell you it's just as brilliant as I thought it would be. So thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. But I just might, I, one thing I just 
to ask you about was um, you were talking actually about trying to get something around um, you know, HIV and sexual health into all programs. Yeah. And I just wondered, I often think um, we often talk about inductions with students mm. and actually starting at that point to, you know, it's quite often it's about what they shouldn't do. Yeah. Whereas I've always we should be actually teaching them about healthy sexual relationships. Yeah, without a doubt. Positive. And I just mm. wondered whether we could introduce some of the things you're, set, you're yeah. talking about there. Yeah, that, that would be wonderful. And even that report from the Higher Education Policy Institute, um, from Michael Natzler and myself, when we were looking at that, the majority of the students were respondents, and there were 1,004 respondents from across the UK, the majority of them were saying they did not get enough in school. So sex and relationship education in school, they didn't get enough. And when they come to university... And actually, that report challenged a lot of the media myths as well. So when lots of the media myths say, oh, people go to university because they want lots of sex uh, and relationships. No, it, it's not quite like that at all. So that report was really so good on clarifying it. But yeah, what the students are saying is they want more. And that's why I'm suggesting if we try to normalise it across the whole institution. So say, for example, with history, whoever does a history degree, look at all the stuff about gendered health and sexual health, um, uh, queer history, all that that's completely written out of history courses. Or geography, if we're talking about climate change at the moment, but right, in the countries where you've seen the climate change happen, what's happening with sexual infections? Where's female genital cutting happening? How are people accessing services? So it's all of our courses looking at how can we include our little bit, and therefore it's going to normalise it. Does that make sense, Jane? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah? I agree, it. Yeah, thank you. Lovely, thanks. Thank you so much, Jane. Kafuri. Hi, thank you so much Hi, for the engaging lecture. Um, I just had a, a question. I was really interested in some of the comments you were making about the relationship between religion and our views about gender and sexuality. Yeah. And you have given the example of um, the creation story, yeah. for example, and like the Abrahamic religion, the yeah. idea of the first human being being Adam, a yeah. man, and a woman coming from yeah. him and then tempting him into sin, and how that's kind of influenced the way we view, and many societies view gender. Yeah. And I was wondering, I mean, I was thinking about some, you know, other um, religious traditions where yeah. the creation myth is different. Like, for example, Without a doubt. the Akan in West Africa, they, they're they a matrilineal society, and then yeah. their creation myth, the first human was a woman. Yeah. And I was wondering whether... Your, whether you've come across any literature that maybe um, looks at how different cultures, their views about creation and spiritual yeah. traditions might influence their gender and maybe how their gender views and how those yeah. gender views might have changed as they adopt other religious traditions like Christianity and Islam. I, I don't know if that's... Yeah, no, that's fantastic. really interesting, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. The, the one person I'd recommend you have a look at then is Professor Camille Paglia. She wrote a book called Sexual Personae. Look, I even know where to grab it off the shelf. <laughs> Sexual Personae by Camille Paglia. She looks at um, uh, different types of world religions, especially when you're talking about uh, um, matrilineal uh, relations as well, looking at all of these differences, but how it's... The male-dominated ones have really pushed it. So when I was talking about um, patriarchal hegemony, for example, look at the way in which, th yeah, the, the Abrahamic religions are very male-dominated. And that's how they've pushed that. And that's how it comes back to us. So even when we're talking about Hollywood um, films, for example, look at the stereotypical notions that keep on going in those. So I'd really recommend Camille Paglia, but what I didn't have time to mention then was one of my um, favourite lecturers when I was uh, studying at the University of Kent was a rabbi. And he was brilliant in taking apart, so uh, biblical exegesis, taking apart all these stories. And he told us that Genesis chapter 2 was actually written about 300 years before Genesis chapter 1. It's only when people put them together in a book format that we got chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 and all that. When they were originally written on scrolls, the chapter 2 story is different. So if you look at the creation myth in, in chapter 2, it's very different. 
Chapter 1 is the procreative imperative. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. But when you look at chapter 2, it's very much about complementarity and equality amongst the genders. So when it says that woman was created from man's rib, what the rabbi told us was that if it had said woman was created from man's head, then women might have said that means we're superior to them. If it had said women were created from man's foot, then men would have said we're going to trample her underground. And they're doing that anyway. But the fact it says from his rib is we're partners in this together. We're equal. So the creation story in chapter 2 is very different to chapter 1. But it's the chapter 1, even when you think of topics like contraception, abortion, all of those things, look at the countries around the world that still might only allow married women to access contraception. You know, so the way in which all these influences... So I'm not taking a knock at religion at all. What I'm saying is there are different religions and they still do impact on the way we think and talk about uh, sexual health now today. And so many of my students still keep telling me that. Yeah, does that make sense? Thank you so much. Yeah, oh, lovely. Thank you, Kafui. Thank you so much, Kafui. Um, David, I realised yeah. that there were some questions in the chat that I have, may have missed. Okay, don't and worry. Tenez, thank you for reminding me to also look at the chat. And there's a question from Evelyn, and this will probably be the last question. Okay. There's also lots and lots of congratulations there for you. Oh, bless. Evelyn. Thanks. I'll go through them all in a bit. So Evelyn asks, um, given your inside knowledge of the church, where there's a role for education there to support priests uh, dealing with church users and believers who come to them with concerns about sexuality, mm -hmm. sexual health, HIV, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, certainly with all the different church leaders. In fact, in England, when the, um, when the then Department of Health wrote its first sexual health strategy, that was back in 2001, they brought a few documents out, and one of them was looking at the role of spirituality around sexual health. So the, the document might still be on the Department of Health website, but it's an old document now, but it was looking at the important role that faith uh, communities and faith leaders can have. Because especially when you look at some of the societies in our world where women still have to ask permission. Let me give you a very quick example here. Um, a PhD I examined a few years ago was looking at the impact of stigma preventing black sub-Saharan African people in the West Midlands of England from accessing HIV services. And one of the things that the researcher found was that um, the biggest group of people opting out of voluntary HIV testing were black African uh, women. So when you went to the antenatal services, they do inclusive testing for everyone, but it was the black sub-Saharan African women that were opting out. So when this researcher went to them and asked, well, why are you opting out? It was all cultural reasons that they gave. It was some people might say things like, well, I can't have any tests or take any medication without my husband's permission. So male domination there. Or another one actually said, um, well, when I married my husband, I was a virgin. So if I got HIV now, only he could have given it to me. But how would I ever start that conversation with him? So lots of it is still based around different cultures, whether in... Um, um, in their own countries or here in our global village in Britain. So, so many, um, uh, so many of these issues have got an impact now today. So, talk, talking to the community leaders and the faith leaders, they may be the ones that people will listen to. But that's no easy task. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosanna. I'm now going to hand over to Derek. Well, wow. Um, can I just apologise, first of all, because by having the last word, I'm not exactly helping to break down um, hegemonic masculinity, um, but I will try anyway. Um, <laughs> so, a big, I mean, a big congratulations and a big thank you. Um, I mean, when, when I joined Greenwich um, in 2018, beginning of 2018, uh, David was being awarded as the lead, and it was, you know, with great pleasure to see him awarded as chair, and I'm very proud, I think we all are, of, of David and, and, and everything that he's, he's achieved. Um, it's taken a while before we've had this inaugural, um, mm -hmm. but I'm sure everyone can agree that it's well worth waiting for. A very fantastic presentation, really, really engaging as ever. Um, 
you know, David's a very engaged communicator, a perfect example, I mean, you breed a professor, um, I think it, we're, we're celebrating practitioner, researcher, educator, all round, um, um, you know, very talented um, uh, all-rounder. Although, um, although I mean, he is challenging society stereotypes of professors, I think, as well as sexuality, which I think is an important thing. Although the fact he's got a, a book for everything behind him <laughs> does, uh, does somewhat play to the stereotype a bit. Um, you've got one. I'm, I bet you've got a few on rugby back there as well, I'm sure. Um, but um, I just think a, a testament of that is going to draw pull one out. Yes, excellent. I thought you were there. Fantastic. I mean, I think it's a testament to David's impact how many external people join us today as well. So a, a big thank you to everybody on the call um, who's joined us from all over the world, I believe. So thank mm. you. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's really important and it is very um, uh, key, I think, that, that this is on, you know, um, International AIDS Day. Um, it is 40 years, I think, since the, the first case of AIDS. And, it's actually very fresh. I mean, to, to, to those of us who lived at that time, it's still very fresh. Obviously, it's not mm. what David's been saying about about um, it's not so much so fresh in this generations or recent generations. But I think it impacted on a whole generation. Obviously, of, yeah. of gay men who lost their lives, and these these were our friends. Um, they were with us in the clubs and the bars one year, and then they weren't there the next. And mm. you know, it impacted on on our formative years and, and very fresh in our memories. And I think it's important to remember this history and to celebrate mm -hmm. the work that's been done over the last 40 years to raise you know, awareness around sexuality, sexual health issues, to challenge the stigma of sexuality and HIV, and to raise awareness of sexual health and the hidden stigma that, that David's talking about now as well, which I think is a, is a very important issue. And, and this is a constant battle, and, and there is much more to be done. I was very taken by your quote, which is the price of liberty, is eternal vigilance. Mm. I think that's really, really important that we continue uh, to be vigilant around these things. So yeah. I think just to summarise, you know, we're very proud to have David as a member of our prof professoriate and to celebrate the important impact that his work has had and that we, you know, it's really important that we have people like David, you know, leading the way for us and keeping us vigilant and aware. And I'm glad he has no plans to leave. Um, I'm glad you stated that. Uh, we're very lucky to have him here at Greenwich and... Um, and, and it's brilliant that he's keeping us all uh, aware and uh, on the ball around around all of these issues. So a big thank you and a big congratulations again, David. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Derek. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, who, whoever you are and from wherever you are. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone, and thank you all.